Up to tossing grenades and mills. Pre Cyber by T. C. Ricks and Ken Leitner. Chapter 52. Clark and Emily woke the next morning in a comfortable bedroom on the second floor of their Galleria hideout. By the standards of how Clark had lived the last few months, it was luxurious. The ambient noise was disorienting to Clark, though. He was used to hearing low conversations and clattered, the clattering of domestic workers in the old hideout. Here, the, those sounds were replaced by early morning commuters on the city buses or honking on the horns of their cars. Emily was still asleep, and Clark could only hear her gently snoring. Clark fell into a trance, watching her, bre her breathe in and out, her chest rising and falling in step. For a moment, he forgot all about the concerns of the last day. He wrapped his arm around her and tried to fall back asleep. Another horn outside woke Emily a moment later. She turned to see Clark facing her with her, his eyelids closed. She whispered, Clark? Oh, uh, did I sleep the whole night? Mm, I'm starved. She, Clark rolled over and released Emily from his arm and sat up. I brought you back food last night, but I didn't want to... I brought you back food last night, but I didn't want to wake you. Great, where is it? Clark replied. I put it in the fridge downstairs. Let's go have it for breakfast. They got up, stretched, and headed down to eat. However, mentioning the food brought the flood of recent memories back to Clark. He said, Ernesto and Che confirmed our theory last night. The two men I traveled with have to be here for the strike. Emily pulled the foam container from the fridge and looked in on the contents. She discovered a cold hamburger and french fries. Clark, Emily turned up her nose at the soggy fries and said, Great, Clark. You'll be able to recognize them? Clark looked at Emily. Sure but we need more information. Emily placed the food in the, mic the mini microwave and then sat down on a large block of concrete. It looked like an abandoned part of an art piece that must have been too heavy to move when they finally closed things down. She pulled her hair back from her face and then gave Clark a long stare. Finally, she took a deep breath and asked, and how do you propose to do that? The only place I can think of is Aqua Nowhere. They're going to have information on the terrorists, and that means we have to break in. There was something in Clark's voice that gave Emily pause. And you think we can do this? Horace and I did this kind of thing all the time. I'm not horse. Clark nodded. He sat down on the concrete block right next to her. No, you're not. I can handle the hacking, but the physical security is going to be something else entirely. I'm not sure I about either of us in a fight. I have some training. Yeah, so have I. The revolution taught me a lot, but he paused and put his hand on the, Emily's leg. I'm not sure it's enough. The problem is I'm not sure what choice we have. Emily tried to think of an alternative plan. We could alert the media, let the public know what's about to happen. The microwave tum timer sounded, and Clark stood to retrieve the food. What? That a vague terrorist threat is going to happen somewhere we don't know at a time we don't know? You know how far we'd get with that? Clark picked up s s one of the soggy fries and waved it about for emphasis. Good point, Emily said as she stood up and relieved Clark of the food container. She put it on the block, picked up the hamburger, and took a huge bite. Clark grabbed a handful more of fries and then leaned back against the wall. The fries tasted terrible, but he was too hungry and too distracted to care. All right, look, we have to do this, but I say we keep this simple. We go in disguise as cleaning staff and then break into the right office. I read some of the reports on Norn's HQ. I think I have a pretty good idea where we can find what we need, and if I'm wrong, it doesn't matter. All I really need is access to the network. Emily continued to chew her first bite on the burger, but Clark could see doubt in her eyes. Emily, we can't let those people die. She swallowed. I know. I know that. She looked like she wanted to cry. Look, I know we need to do something. I guess I just don't think getting us killed is the answer. There isn't anyone else, Emily. The whole revolution could be compromised. We don't know who to trust. Plus, I wouldn't be surprised if they blame the revolution for who, whatever these terrorists plan. That means years of hard work destroyed in seconds. Getting in as cleaning staff, it turned out to be easier than they thought. Apparently, Norn had hosted some kind of celebration, which in turn required Aquanoir to bring in a small army of temporary help and extra security. They both tried not to look nervous with all the armed guards about. Luckily, the celebration had distracted most of the guards. Some had even joined in the festivities. Emily managed to find a particularly drunk guard that Norn was in a particularly forgiving mood. 
they found the IT services. They found the IT services department, and from there, Clark was able to log onto the network with a password he found in the top drawer. He started working his way through the system, looking for Norn's computer. However, as he worked, he found something. He, he felt something bothering him in the back of his mind. And the place reeked of noirisms. It had motivational posters on the wall. The desks sat in little cubicle walls, with each computer terminal identical to the next. Next to each terminal sat a corporate issue frame with a random photo of so the employee's family, girlfriend, or commonly, a cat. Above, fluorescent lights flickered on and off, sucking the life force from everything beneath them. As Clark poked around the network, he couldn't help but shudder. Noir had its fingers in a lot of pies, and almost all the information it collected went through here. That was the good news. The bad news was that their encryption, proto encryption protocols were demonic. Clark sweated as he continued to tap on keys while precious time passed. He stayed so focused on trying to crack their security that he failed to notice the rather familiar picture in the office directly across from where they sat. Mrs. Heath? Mary blinked the sleep away from her eyes. The caller ID said corporate IT security. Mary sighed, and that could only mean trouble. What is it? We have a hacker in the building, a good one, using Randall's ID and workstation down in IT. They've already breached into the secure data server. I've been watching them from the internal security cams. Shall we call security? It's just that we don't know who, who knows the secure protocol over here. I understand, and she did. The night watch just men monitored the dials on the screen. They could not arrest anyone, and if they could, they lacked the clearance to see the information this hacker allegedly just obtained. Still, someone was supposed to have, duty, have the duty tonight. Why did these things always fall on her? She called up the babysitter. Erla, I need you to come babysit for me tonight. She had the phone in her car while she threw on the basics of clothing and checked on her boy. She found him asleep in his bed and adjusted his blanket, kissed him on the forehead, and walked downstairs. They had both been taking an after-school nap so they could stay out for the late drama thing downtown tonight. Now Erla would have to wake him. Mary hated missing those things, but she had to keep her job. What, do you know what time it is? Erla was not happy with the situation. Mary couldn't blame her. I'll pay you double tonight. I have an emergency at work, but we also have tickets to drama, the drama thing downtown. Erla did not hesitate. I'll be there in five minutes. That gave me, maybe, that gave... That gave Mary a little pause for the future. If Erla was desperate for cash, what would she say to a potential kidnapper looking for inside help? She decided to fire her tomorrow. Tonight, she needed a babysitter. On the other hand, maybe Erla liked drama that much. Once Erla arrived, Mary drove to Aquanoir. She made a 15-minute drive in seven minutes. She had to make some rather risky driving moves, but she needed this resolved and to get back home before Erla could cause any trouble. She slammed on the brakes in the parking lot and ran inside, leaving her car parked in the fire lane. Music hit her senses like a punch in the gut. Mary rolled her eyes. Norn had planned a hasty party yesterday, but Mary had decided to skip the event. Whoever had the on-call duty tonight was probably too inebriated to respond. She ignored several partygoers and went to the IT security office. What's the situation? Mary looked around, trying to find the video as she talked. She had to push the security guard aside, but finally saw the man and woman dressed as caterers hovering over a terminal in one of the IT service cubicles. What happened to the cubicle farm just outside? What, which happened to be the cubicle farm just outside of her own window's office? The person at the keyboard responded, "We have two intruders, but we don't know their identity." But fine, interrupted Mary. Whatever they planned to say, Mary didn't have the patience to find out. Give me a gun. The guard looked dubious, but handed the weapon to her. She said, I want four guys re guards ready in case I need them. However, I plan to handle this alone. The ship's supervisor nodded. Please remind them to stay away unless they hear trouble. A few moments later, she crept toward the entrance of her office. She loved her office and its spectacular view. While not her home, she could not help but a s feel a sense of violation. They were too close. She turned a corner and saw the intruders up close. They looked familiar. No, it couldn't be. Clark, you saw you, she said in the most deadly voice you could imagine. Put your hands high into the air where I can see them. You too, she pointed the gun at Emily. Emily raised her hand ob obsequiously. Clark stopped. He'd heard that voice. It had something to do with horse. Mary said, what are you doing here? Emily pleaded. We're trying to stop a terrorist strike. We're not trying to steal anything. Oh, honestly, it looks more like you're planning to strike on Aqua Noir. How could you... 
prying into our secure database have anything to do with stopping terrorism? Aquanera fights terrorists, Emily replied. Maybe they do, but maybe they stir up business occasionally as well. What can it hurt to let us fitching, finish searching now? Clark looked slowly back at the keyboard. He'd finally cracked their security, and the computer was running a search while they talked. If he could just stall for a few minutes, they might have the proof they needed. Mary shouted, Get away from the computer! Clark moved to the side. She looked at the terminal and said, What's running here? She shot Clark's thumb drive and yanked it out. Clark replied, It's a search program I wrote. It scans the computer hard drive, looking for information. It can read 42 of the most common file formats and search for keyboards. Clark decided the more he told Mary, the longer the search might have to run. It can read compressed folders as well. It doesn't hurt anything, and so long as you're not caught in the act, it leaves no trace, Clark said with a silly grin. I wrote it myself. The thumb drive you found has the source code. Want to see? Mary said, just make it stop. I don't believe you for a second. Then finally Clark remembered, Marauder's Crag. You're the mother of the kid from Marauder's Crag. Well, I knew I recognized you. Heck, you owe me a few million dollars. I was the one who hacked into the game and made it possible for you to win again. You're the hacker as well? Huh. As well as what? Mary said, you don't remember me? I'm the nasty caller. You were complaining about your gold farming activities. I put out a formal complaint. I was told by corporate security that you'd never be able to play again, Clark laughed. That seems like a long time ago. You did cause me some trouble back then. The two had nearly forgotten Emily, who was still standing there back with her hands when she interjected. Clark, the search found something. Clark turned to face the terminal and looked closer. Mary had took, uh, pu pulled the gun up, but followed him over to get a look. The screen showed two files, named Atlanta Strike Plan and Atlanta Strike Plan 2. Mary said, those files are on Nern's own personal computer. You can't read them from here. Emily asked awfully, can you help us? Mary looked aghast. Wait, you really are here to find terrorists? This isn't some stupid gold farming hack? Mary spoke again. Yes, we have credible information that someone in this corporation has planned to strike a big strike to drum up business. Clark saw the terrorists, but we don't know who they were at the time. But we didn't know who they were at the time. I don't believe you. You're just covering yourselves for yourselves. Clark started to speak, but then realized Emily was having a much better effect on their captor. He closed his mouth and looked at Emily. Emily said, fine. I understand your mistrust. We deserve it. Clark here deserves it twofold. But what if we're telling the truth? What if you could have stopped this thing and saved dozens of lives? What if you don't stop it and have, the, have to live the rest of your life knowing you could have? Mary cried out, Just what do you expect me to do for you? I can't fight terrorists. Emily spoke, Just help us read these files. Take us to Norn's office. If you can't find out we were lying, you can claim you were taking us to him for interrogation. Mary stared at her. She had no idea what to do next. However, as much as she distrusted Clark Usarian, this woman with him made sense. She still thought she was being manipulated, but there was just enough doubt after seeing the search results that she decided to see it through. Okay. She sounded like she should not, could not believe what she was saying. You're right. I have nothing to lose and everything to gain, so let's go then. We'll need to do this from Norn's office. Clark and Emily smiled and asked in unison, Which way? This has been the Tossing Grenades at Windmills podcast. I'm Thomas Ricks. Music by Melanie Ricks. Voices by Skip Huffman and Josie Bergen Lawson. Copyright 2012. Kenneth Leitner and Red Anvil Amalgamated. To fight the forces of evil!